That wasn't on the mall. I hope you open some mall. That's not on the mall, Jim. Mall. Mall. The mall's not open, Jim. My name is Jack Albertine. It's my honor the to the host of this meeting. Steve Darboloff is, of course, chairman of the Millipore Corporation. He was recently elected a vice chairman of the American Business Conference, Where's the a national organization limited to the chief the executive sound. officers of mid sized high growth publishing. In addition, Dee is a co founder of the Massachusetts High Technology Council, past chairman of the Health Industry Manufacturers Association past chairman and the trustee of Johns Hopkins, Hopkins University. In addition, D is a co in addition, D has been a driving force within the American Business Conference to do nationally what has been done so splendidly in Massachusetts. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, it's my honor to introduce our host, D. Darbalot. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jack. And Mr. President, we are certainly honored and feel very privileged by your visit to Millipore today. Uh, I'm particularly pleased that uh, we can talk off the record. Uh, <laughs> because we're going to use some fairly technical terms like private sector initiative, free enterprise, and we might even have some good news. <laughs> <clears throat> Millipore is a company that has pioneered in the field of what we call separations technology. It's really dealing with products and technologies that are critical to advancing the fields of medicine, electronics, we're deeply involved in water purification and biotechnology. We really provide scientists throughout the world with the tools they require to capitalize on the biological revolution this country and the world is going through. We're a company of sales about $270 million. We employ 4,000 people. And even in today's environment, our sales and earnings are going up. <clears throat> in America. And there's 200 pages of facts and figures in that book <laughs> that tells about our problems and our opportunities. And we highly commend it to you for your bedtime reading. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ray. Mr. President, <clears throat> uh, on your right next to Jack Albertine is Roger Wellington. And Roger is president of AUGAD, another high technology company in Massachusetts. He's a member of the American Business Conference, and he's also a director of the American Electronics Association. And Roger will talk a little bit about tax issues at the national level. Well. That's just fine with me, all right. Uh, uh, I see you have a couple of camera clubs, though, that dropped in. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, no, and I've been most interested in some of the things that were said here, and because of the problems and uh, that you mentioned, when you mentioned on, in uh, education and in the tax structure, you know that we labor under a political uh, climate that has been made popular over the years in which uh, automatically there is a reaction to a suggestion such as you made about capital gains that this is designed solely to uh, benefit the rich, whoever the rich are supposed to be. Um, we do know that every time that we have made alterations downward in the capital gains tax, the government has increased its revenues from that tax by making capital gain investments and sales and so forth more attractive than they are. Uh, the same is true of some of the other uh, tax things that we believe. And there is a tendency to forget that uh, in the long run, it is out of that growing gross national product that every individual and every worker in this country is, is going to benefit. Uh, I know 
I have some figures not with me here about several years ago. Uh, what had happened when the taxes and the marginal rates were increased, but particularly the capital gains tax, and how in the open market, uh, the money markets, Wall Street, the billions of dollars that had been traded and sold in, uh, well, uh, to, to capitalize uh, industries like your own, particularly smaller industries that were getting started, the entrepreneurs and so forth, within a very few years, just a couple of years, at the new higher rates, that had dwindled down to just a few million dollars, 15 million dollars, I think, and only a couple of those entrepreneur-type companies that had gone to the marketplace uh, for funding. Uh, I think one of the challenges facing all of us on all of this is uh, there is a great lack of understanding among otherwise well-educated and intelligent people on things of this kind and the marketplace, how it functions and what is required uh, to make it work. And uh, much of what remains is, is uh, prejudice. The educational subject that you brought up uh, there and about the uh, higher education, I'm wondering again, and how do we get at this problem of whether uh, we're getting all that the dollars invested should buy? Because with inflation down to 3.9% in 1982, we found there were two areas, one we know of is health care, that was up several times as high in its inflation rate as the national average. Second to it was education, which was increasing in cost in 1982 at somewhere in excess, well, between 8 and 9%, not at 3.9 or even holding down there. And here again, I wonder, particularly in those tax-supported institutions and those that have government help, have we done the same thing there that we've done to some individuals? Have we become, it's so easy and dependent on government that uh, business practices that would be uh, absolute imperatives in your own businesses are no longer applying, for example, in that field to education? I, I'm accused of telling anecdotes and so forth, but let me just give one example. I, while I was governor of California, I visited a state-supported institution, higher education. It was up in the north of our state in what uh, would, you would expect that a school of forestry and uh, engineering and so forth would be uh, the, uh, uh, more the principal functions there. But having been in the business I'd been in before I was governor, I was proudly shown through their theater arts department. And I was shown their TV studios. They even had a revolving stage uh, so that they could have movable sets and so forth and a shop for building them and a complete theater. And I couldn't resist. I finally said to the man in charge who was so proud of this, I said, may I tell you that if any of your graduates ever make it big in show business, Broadway, Hollywood, television, they will never again perform in facilities equal to those that you've given them to learn in. <laughs> but, um, well, you, you said questions, and you probably would rather do that than my uh, just um, teeing off here on the subject, so why don't you begin? Okay. Um, <clears throat> uh, why don't I just ask for, uh, for some hands in terms of somebody who'd like to rate? Yes, Mill. I'm Milton Greenberg, and I'm president of GCA Corporation, Mr. President. Those of us in the high technology industry are very, very worried about the growing sentiment in Congress and amongst our world trading partners about protectionism, the imposition of non-tariff barriers, et cetera, et cetera. And as you know, Mr. President, that one of the driving forces behind the growth of high technology industries everywhere, including this country, is our ability to export and to sell in a free and open fashion, regard and based mainly on quality and effectiveness to the consumer. 
How can we be helpful to your administration to ensure that these markets remain free and open and even uh, increase for us? Well, when you put the question as to how you can be helpful, just simply in being supportive of what we're trying to do. We do believe in free trade, but it has to be fair trade also. And we do know that there is a wave of protectionism, and there are countries that uh, uh, we deal with today that uh, through various devices, regulations that don't have anything to do with tariffs, uh, make it very difficult for our products to, to enter their market. I think that you're all well aware I am that the high technology field is one in which while we lead today, uh, we are target for tonight in the phrases of World War II, that other countries are zero, zeroing in on this market just as they have in previously in, in other areas. Um, I don't believe that retaliatory protectionism is the answer at all because every time it's ever been employed it's a two-way street and it just ends it, it gets down to lesser trade and uh, less jobs and less prosperity we have been uh, it hasn't been widely publicized because I'm a believer in more quiet diplomacy but we have had our people and our teams from commerce and uh, Bill Brock ambassador Brock's uh, section and other levels, uh, virtually in constant negotiations with our allies and our friends, uh, both Japan, Europe, on persuading them to join us in a, in a freer marketplace to get rid of those restrictive regulations that they, uh, that they have. I, I should think on the tariff basis we have we should have learned our lesson in the Great Depression and the part that was played in that by the Smoot-Hawley uh, tariff bills. So anything that you can do to be supportive of us in resisting, which we're going to have to do, I know, in the days ahead, uh, the protectionist wave that is growing uh, in our own Congress uh, will be beneficial because, uh, as I say, while we believe in free trade, we are still going to do our utmost to see that it is fair trade. We don't believe that we can accomplish that by then automatically uh, slamming the gates and joining them in protectionism. Thank you, Thank you sir. Do we have time for one more question, Mr. President? Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> John? John Cullinane, uh, Cullinane Database Systems. Uh, uh, Mr. President, I was recently asked to chair a committee on behalf of the Mass High Tech Council on Computer Liter Literacy kindergarten to the uh, 12th grade, and uh, more recently I was asked to chair the advisory committee for Northeastern University's new uh, College of uh, Computer Sciences. So many of us uh, were quite interested in your comments last night about tax incentives or other incentives to uh, parents, the average American, in terms of uh, uh, related to the cost of education and, and what could be done in that, that area. Obviously, jobs are important for these, uh, these children, and, and uh, naturally, the high-tech community can benefit from that. And we wonder what your nuances of your program were and what we can do also to help in that particular cause. Well, we are exploring what we can do uh, to make it possible for more families to contribute to the educational costs. If you look back at the history of the college or of the government getting involved in everything from the workfare program to, or the work study program to uh, student loans to guaranteed loans to the outright Pell grants and so forth. And I know that we've been uh, uh, assailed as trying to cut back on that and in this way we're trying to deprive people otherwise that would otherwise get an education. Uh, no, what we were trying to do in whatever cutbacks we made was to see that the money was directed to, doors, to those people whose family incomes were such that very obviously they could not get higher education without some kind of help. But the truth of the matter is, as the government has grown in billions and billions of dollars in the student aid programs, the percentage of family help to students has visibly declined. And the interest rates were higher than they are now. Uh, it wasn't hard to discover that some families who could otherwise afford to 
send their offspring to college were resorting to loan programs because by borrowing the money at the low interest for a college loan, they could then put that money back in treasury notes at the same treasury where they had obtained the loans at a higher rate of interest, use their own money to send the young people to school. They were making a profit on it. These were the things that we were trying to head off. But we are studying right now programs that will make it more possible for the, the family to help. I mentioned one last night. Uh, Monday is when we uh, will disclose the budget and what it is that uh, we are proposing, but we do have in mind a program, a savings program, in which there will be a tax incentive for people to start saving for their children's eventual college education. Try and induce them to do that. That at the same time will, of course, aid in our amassing of capital because that money will then be available for investment and so forth as it's put into the savings accounts. Um, we want very much uh, to see that happen. We also are resisting a tendency that has even been encouraged in many institutions that the student who gets through school on student loans, if they're from the government, doesn't need to pay them back. As a matter of fact, when I was governor, we even found some institutions that were giving instructions as to how they could avoid paying them back at the same time they were helping them process the loan applications. But um, this is important, and it must be done. In connection with this and your remarks about education, I, I note that all of this and the help and the fine help that you've been given is directed toward higher education. Are we ignoring a problem down at basic education that is, uh, is a part of our problem, that we have, the, we have seen it in our military forces. We've, we've seen uh, the high, well, as a mother put it to me one day in a meeting that I had with a group of parents, and she said to me, don't talk about busing my child to a school or anything else. She said, I want my child kept in the class he's in until he learns what he's supposed to have learned in that class, not graduated from that class and pushed into another one because he'd simply come to the end of the term. Now, there is a lot of that going on also in education today, and then we find that we have to, or have had to in the past. I think you'll be happy to know that the intelligence level, and the capability in that regard of our armed forces today is remarkably higher than it has been in uh, past years. But there was a time in which training manuals had to be written down to a reading level that was uh, uh, far down in the elementary grade level, and yet high school graduates were doing this. And of course, the other thing we do know at the college level is, uh, is there a university today that doesn't have a bonehead English course uh, that freshmen have to take so that they can begin to uh, handle uh, the, uh, uh, the studies that they're going to get in, in, uh, at that higher level. Are we, uh, are we, as I said last night, stopping to think that that child who hasn't had the proper amount of math and science by the time he's 16, which is getting up to one year away from high school graduation, uh, they're never going to be able to be a scientist or an engineer or hold the jobs that you will one day be advertising for. I recently went through the want ads in the Los Angeles Times on a Sunday when I was out there in the last trip over the New Year holiday, and I was amazed at the, in the 45 and a half pages of help wanted ads, that how many of those ads were from companies like your own in high technology, and they weren't just advertising they had an opening for someone, they were begging for people to come in. They were offering inducements. Please come take our job rather than another. Um, this, this problem confronts us now. I know that I'm preaching sermons here instead of uh, maybe giving specific answers, but uh, we think that we uh, are going to come up with a program that will be helpful in that making it more possible. I, I look back in 
I feel sorry for some of the young people today because one of the better jobs I ever had in my life was the job I had working my way through college. I washed dishes in the girls' dormitory. <laughs> Have I overstayed my welcome? Not a bit. Not a, not a bit, Mr. President. But I do know that your schedule is tight, and I know that you're running late. And I understand that you have some concluding remarks that you would like to make. Well, I want to thank you and tell you how much this entire day has meant to me. I have been in a rarefied atmosphere, beginning over there at that wonderful institution, OIC, where I saw those young people learning uh, the computer science. And um, all of these young people who heretofore had been denied the privileges of, of such things in their surroundings, they told me that the, they have just graduated 29 of these young people, and 12 of them are already placed in jobs. Four more have, uh, have just been added to that number, and that there are 10 more who are very likely uh, to get jobs soon. I've had the privilege of looking into America's future, I think, today, and the future looks good. And uh, I know that you're aware I've given a bedrock speech or two about the principles that we must get back to in our country, reducing tax rates, the growth of federal spending, reviving the magic of the market, and bringing government closer to the people. The trouble is sometimes those principles seem about as popular in Washington as mandating a 14-hour workday on Christmas. <laughs> but, uh, I just wish that more people would come here. It wasn't too long ago that your state was known as Taxachusetts. Right. And that social contract that you made and that resulted in the more than 60,000 jobs for this state, and its place now in the high technology field was a result of some changes in that tax policy. You had a vision, you took action, you turned the situation around. This is a living laboratory of progress and proof that the pri private sector can work with local governments to solve problems and move America forward. I'm very impressed that your companies have trained or retrained so many people to produce high-tech products. You're changing people's lives, and that's a wonderful thing to do. This country was founded and built by people with great dreams and the courage to take great risks. The company that I visited just before this one in the same field of high technology, or in a different field, but high technology, 25 years ago was started by three men. And uh, today it's in a dozen countries around the world. It's numbers its employees in the more than 60,000 and it does almost $4 billion in sales a year. Where in the world do things like that happen? But um, I think that pioneer spirit that we've had is still alive, only it isn't out on the prairie now. It's in institutions such as this. I understand that a nearby radio station, WFMP and WFGL, are, have launched its own programs to encourage more permanent private sector jobs by offering free advertising to the companies that create those, those jobs. Two years ago, I asked our citizens to join together in a national crusade to make America great again. We faced some awesome problems, but we've also made real progress in bringing down the crippling interest rates, inflation, and the tax rates that were smothering growth. Our crusade goes forward. We will take new steps to rebuild our country. We're still the technological leaders in the world, and we must not only keep that edge, we must increase it. So I intend to open a national dialogue on how our private sector can export more goods and create more jobs at home and abroad. To strengthen our firms, to compete more effectively, we need to better mobilize the tools and resources of science and technology. So let me tell you today, we will soon create a nonpartisan commission on industrial competitiveness. And I'll ask the commission to make specific policy recommendations to me. And I'm asking all of you to lend us your experience, your wisdom, and every bit of energy that you can spare. Now, another piece of news for you, the budget that I'll be submitting to the Congress next week will reflect two key initiatives to spur research and development. We will propose unprecedented increases in fundamental research 
because it offers essential support for our industries and our defense needs. And we will channel this research into the most promising areas, those most likely to extend the benefits of our American science expertise to industry. As you know, research is the wellspring of ideas that lead to new technologies such as the transition and the laser. It's also the, the transistor, I should say, and it's also the key source for the highly trained scientists and engineers that, as I've already mentioned, we will need to lead us into the next century. So I hope you won't mind it if during my travels I become something of an apostle for your success story here. To get back to the very beginning and a mention that had to do with the tax structure of our country. I realize that there will be a great stirring and I'll probably kick myself for having said this. But when are we all going to have the courage to point out that in our tax structure, the corporate tax is very hard to justify its existence? That why isn't the so-called corporate tax simply passed on to the stockholders in which they then, based on whatever bracket they're in, will pay in individual income tax. And won't this do something about that educational map that we saw up there? The endowments of institutions, I saw how very slim that one up there was for how much those institutions higher education gets from, um, from endowment. But those are supposed to be tax-free institutions. And much of their endowment is invested out there in industrial America. But if they're tax-free, aren't they paying a 46% tax rate before they get the results, the dividends that they get from the holdings that they have? And thus, wouldn't it be more fair to them? Wouldn't it be more fair to the labor union pension funds invested in that same industry if they got as dividends and they wouldn't have to pay tax on it because they are tax-free, but other individuals, it wouldn't be a loss to the government. I think there would be a net gain to the government all the way around if we would look at that instead of sticking with what is literally a myth about corporations and uh, what the taxing policy should be. Um, I can assure you that your announcement of establishing a commission is very exciting to us. And ABC, the growth companies of this country, are going to be more than willing to help you. Mr. Thank President, you. I thank you so much for accepting my invitation, and you were so gracious to be here at Milliport. Well, today. I am most pleased to be here, believe me. Thank you.